Brian Eno also once told me that a great pop song is summarized by its title. True? Okay, so if you, his point was that a really great pop song, you knew that you, you basically heard the whole song, you, you got the whole thrill of it just off the title. Yeah, yes, I think it's, it's true. And the reason it's true is because it means, if it can be condensed in the title, it probably means it's a very strong idea. And therefore, it's going to be a strong pop song. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of our more famous songs, you know, it's a scene, it's all, it's all in the title, West End Girls, mm. West End um, Girls. Left to My Own Devices, mm -hmm. That the being actually being boring, no, it's, it's the meaning of the song is the opposite of that. Um, oh. But uh, yeah, there's there's quite a lot of truth in it. Yeah. 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 Whether um, that's helpful, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting because Eno was talking. I mean, he went on to talk about Roxy music titles, and he said for him a title like Over You or Same Old Scene or whatever was, you know, you got the whole song just out of the title, and I think he sort of got a point. But, yeah, no, in every dream home a heartache. Yeah, that's yeah. another one. Yeah. But one of the other the, the question that follows on from this is um, again about lyrics and about meaning, really. Um, do you believe that a, a a a great pop song and the two examples I chose were "Sally Go Round the Roses" by the Janettes and "Jeepster" by T Rex. That a they're both examples of fantastic pop songs that aren't about anything, really. They're a, they're, they're, they're a sort of tribal charm. They're, a, sort of, they're an energy. And you could say that Vocal by Pet Shop Boys is very similar. Um, well, no, Vocal is very specifically about... Well, dancing and raves, but... Yeah, it's... Well, that's, that's a, some. I mean, if you, you mentioned Jeepster. I mean, Mark Bolan was a genius at writing brilliant gobbledygook poetry that's, that rocked a metal guru. Mm. Is it true? Mm. I mean, it's, fan, it's a fantastic lyric and it sings fantastic. fantastically and it's glamorous. Mm. And so what it says is sort of by inference rather than by spelling mm. it out. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's many examples of Pet Shop Boys of you, with your own lyrics of things like that, of where it's it's almost I can think of one or two. Um, I mean, vocal I think is such an extraordinary pop song, but then I don't know if it's a pop song really. It's. I um, it mean, it's a dance record rather than mm -hmm. a pop song. Mm -hmm. But I don't really have the brain that writes a metal guru. Mm. Um, I would like to be able to write gobbledygook. There's a, there's a B-side in this, the lyrics in this book called mm. Don Juan, where mm. I was trying to write something in the style of Edith Sitwell, mm. the English poet of the 1920s, 30s and 40s. And, um, and she wrote sort of great gobbledygook. Mm. And, um, and I tried to do it with that, but it's too much of a stretch for me, really. Mm. Mm. Um, you also say in the annotations to your lyrics, um, it's interesting because it gives us a guide to the sort of things you read and listen to and all the rest of it, and you say that you've never read Proust. And well, who has? <laughs> <laughs> and my question was, do you intend to? Do you know, I think the moment where I would do that might have passed. <laughs> um, but I keep thinking I might read the Palliser novels by Anthony Trollope. Good luck with that. Yeah. But I think there's only six of them. Um, I bought them at home. And also, I'd love to read the entire human comedy by Balzac. Because yeah. I've probably read three of them, the three mm. famous ones. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an amazing thing to do, to write a series of novels that covers an mm. entire era mm. of a country and its culture and its history, oh. in a period where its culture and history are really fascinating. Well, I'm going to seize the moment to repeat what I said at the start. I think your records do that. I think that they chart 
if you want the end, for the, the end of the machine age and the beginning of the digital age, I think that they cover, like a novel myself, I mean, I don't suppose you set out for one moment to do that. But. No, but we, we have, over a period of 35 years, written pop songs about what's going on around us. I was going to say social... So you, you sort of collect that after 35 years. Without setting out to do it, you've, you've done it because you've collected that from, from early Thatcherism mm. to Brexit. Mm. Mm. And also you've often said in interviews that social commentary is uh, one of your main motivations for writing, is that... Well, it's, it's not it, main, but it's in there. It is, because it comes out of reading and conversation and living. Mm. Um, I, so I find it very difficult. And also, it's just ridiculous sometimes. And, and mm. so I, I find it inspiring. Mm. Mm. Um, I'm going to ask Neil one more question. And then what would be really fabulous would be if you could all join in. I mean, not with this question. <laughs> but... <laughs> Well, it's an idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, for, for all the quiet, quietus listeners at home, yeah. because this, this is being broadcast live as we speak. Broadcast live. Um, big so, shout to those people. Big, yes. Um, so I'm going yeah, to ask one more, and then we're going to turn it over to you, because you, I know you all have really great questions, and Neil's very happy to answer them. Um, and so my last question to you at the moment is... Sorry. Yes. Does intellectualism have a place in pop music? Likewise, as argued by Dan Fox, can pretentiousness be a creative virtue? Virtue. I think, I'll answer the second half first, um, as politicians always say. Um, I think pretentiousness can really be a virtue in pop music simply because it's trying to expand pop music. It's trying to bring something into pop music which isn't normally there. So if you, you wrote something, I'm being attacked by a fly, if you, if you, you know, write something about the Russian Revolution and pop music. It's pretentious, it is. Um, but it's brought something new, and so maybe, it, maybe that pretentiousness has a freshness about it. And what was the first thing? I forgot. Uh, does intellectualism have a place? Intellectualism is difficult in pop music because pop music, the very notion of pop music, is that it should be, it should have an ease about it. Um, so something can be mysterious, hmm. but still have an ease about it. Whereas if you're closely arguing something um, in intellectual terminology and language, hmm. I mean, I try, to do, I try to refer to it in Love as a Bourgeois hmm. Construct, but not be it. So I mm. think my answer is no, I don't think it does. Mm. It could do in art songs, which is a, mm. a distant cousin of the pop, a cousin of the pop song, but it's mm -hmm. not really, it's not mm. really pop. Yeah, I mean, I think, yes, I think, I think we can, intellectualism, no pretentiousness, yes. Yes, I think that's, there you yeah, go. That's yeah. that up. Right, great. Um, so, yeah, questions, please. Yes. Okay, so there are, my goodness, there are roving microphones. Yes, there's a lady... Uh, hello. Where's yeah. Hang on. <laughs> the lady down here, a blonde lady. Thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure for me. Uh, thank you, Neil, for being here and for making music for so many years. It's, I've been a fan for like 20 years, really. And I want to express a gratitude and honor to be here today and tonight. And uh, actually, my question is, um, I've read, I had a brief time before this event to read a poem that is in your book. So how many years does it, well, how many years it took you to write this? I mean, the poem. Yes. <laughs> and will we have the half two of the poem? Maybe, should you read the poem? Well, I can remember the poem. The okay. poem, 
is that the, the poem I wrote a few years ago, um, and I thought we'd put it in a song, but it, I tried to lengthen it and develop it, but I realized it only worked as four lines. And the reason I put it in the book, and the reason I called the book 100 Lyrics and a Poem, was to make the point that the lyrics are lyrics and the poem is a poem and the poem works spoken and the lyrics are meant to be sung and in writing a pop lyric you're not it's a different medium than poetry um, and so the poem which i wrote i think five or six or seven years ago just goes every day it passes by the day one year on which i'll die the date is not revealed to me. It keeps its secret patiently. Which is a sort of slightly morbid idea that, for instance, every I know, October the 12th, I don't know that October the 12th and several years time we're going to die. Um, but I like the fact of ending the book as well with a little meditation on death. It seemed, to, it seemed <laughs> a nice final subject. And also by a very happy coincidence, because the lyrics are all in alphabetical order, it follows your funny uncle, which is a song about a funeral. So it it, it, it follows on from that quite well. Okay, and that yeah. that was my poetry career in four lines. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's a guy up there with his hand up next to a light. Yes. Yes. Hi, uh, um, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but I've always thought you seemed like quite a private person and that you keep your private life quite private. Uh, and, you know, you didn't come out as a, as a gay man and publicly until the mid-90s. I wonder how you feel that has affected how you've written lyrics, both sort of up to that point, how sort of open you've been and, and since. I don't know that it's... a. It, well, what it does is it leads you to maybe, as I was saying before about my friend when he had AIDS, I wrote the lyric for It Couldn't Happen Here. In a way, maybe you disguise simple meanings behind beautiful phrases or, 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 or in some sort of poetic, lyrical language. But another thing is that it leads you to sort of tease people. You know, like we were at Rent, it was a sort of a tease that we'd written. They were, they were playing a song on Radio 1 called Rent. It was obviously inspired by Rent Boys, but the song's not really about that. Um, but as time's gone on, that doesn't really seem to matter as much because society has changed in a lot of countries anyway so much. Um, that it doesn't, it just doesn't see, it all seems quite, everything's, everything seems very normal now. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, if you were gay in the 80s, you had a sense that you represented a sort of specific culture. And even if you weren't saying that, it was, it was giving you a sort of, sense of undercover pride and subversion or something like that um, that doesn't really that can't really exist anymore um, because maybe we live in a more open and healthier society um, here and in, in a lot of the world so it, it probably did influence me a bit early on but I don't think it does now. There's also the thing, of course, that when you're writing about your personal life, that involves other persons, and you don't want to sort of embarrass them. Um, and so there's maybe a level of subterfuge simply about protecting your friends and relationships. And that's also when a sort of poetic approach can come in, maybe. Okay, yeah, there's a gentleman here with a... Hi, Neil. Um, Hi. What can you tell us uh, about Pet Shop Boys' plans for next year? <laughs> hey! <laughs> um, well, well, mate, this isn't to do with the book, really, but anyway, never mind. Um, 
I was assuming we'd be asked this. Um, we have written, so far this year, now 24 new songs. Two... <laughs> Two since the last time someone asked me this question. Um, we're going to be releasing an album, I think, in the second half of next year. Actually, we have some other things going on, but I'm not going to... There's a sort of a, a theatrical stroke dance thing on the offing as well. Wow. Oh, sorry, there's a woman in the front. Hello, Neil. Oh, you're in the you're in the <laughs> Royal Opera House video three times. Oh! <laughs> She's in the front row both <laughs> nights. Uh, we, we just saw the we're releasing the whatever medium you release these things on nowadays. Um, we're releasing the film of the Royal Opera House shows from July, uh, which <laughs> which we just saw actually last week, and it actually looks it looks it looks. I was amazed actually. It looks really good. It looks great. Thank, thank and you're you for... in three shots. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Neil. <laughs> so, um, you've been talking about uh, love songs, and since I very recently got a, a marriage proposal... Oh, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> thank yeah. you. And I was asking myself, why, which song would be perfect for, uh, as a soundtrack for a wedding or... A, <laughs> well, Michael's already given it to you. Yes, but... He'd definitely leave to remain. To remain. It would be a nice song. <laughs> yes. And then I ha also have another question for you, if I may. Someone told me once, they were playing You Only Tell Me You Love Me When You're Drunk at their wedding. <laughs> at, at, the end, at the end of that the celebration. Horrified. Absolutely <laughs> horrified. Maybe at the end of the celebration, it would yes. be good. <laughs> and another question I have in mind is... Uh, you pay so much attention choosing the words you use in your songs and maybe you also are you also following uh, onomatopoeic uh, choose from the songs by the sound itself of oh, the, the sound song. yes yes I think the sound you know you can when we write a song um, I might sometimes have the words in advance anyway but if I write them I'll often go back um, I was in studio with Pete Claire the week before last, just repairing, changing the lyric on a demo of a song we'd written. Uh, and then you can take it away again and then come back and change them again, you know. And um, because you just want it, well, as I said earlier, you know, to have an ease. Um, and yet, to keep you interested. And those two things are sort of have a sort of tension, really. Um, but you, when you get it right, it's, you can just tell it's right. Um, and that sometimes takes, takes quite a while. But yes, I do like, I mean, I've referred this song three times now, but Love is a Bourgeois Construct, what I really liked about that was bourgeois construct. <laughs> um, but taking academic language and putting it in a pop song. Um, uh, and so it was just a fun way of doing that. So that was definitely about the sound of the lyrics, the sound of the words. Yeah, there's a gentleman up That was there. it. Is there a mic person? Yeah. See, a guy, yeah. Just behind the sound desk, standing up, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Uh, first of all, Neil, uh, thank you for your music. It's thank you. It's enriched my life. Thank you. Uh, but the question I wanted to ask you, if, if you'd like to answer, because it may be personal, but I notice you've dedicated this book to Susan, Simon and Philip. Yes. I'm wondering who they are and what have they done to deserve this? <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. Well, Susan, Simon and Philip are my sister and two brothers. And... You know, they've lived through the whole trip. <laughs> um, and I thought, and they've always been very supportive. And um, my brother Simon helped us, who sort of works in finance a bit, he helped us set up Cage Music, for instance, in 1983 or four. And um, 
Uh, they've always been there, and very, very supportive. And I mean, you know, when, I, when the Petro Boys took off, I've said many times before, I was 31 years old, losing my hair, had a good job. It was a totally ridiculous idea um, to leave. I was, they wanted me to be editor of Smash Hits. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I threw this away to, because I wanted to be a pop star when I was 31. And, um, and luckily it worked out. Well, they were very supportive in that, in that decision, which not everyone was, you know. Yeah. And so it was just my way of, of uh, thanking them. And also, of course, they're my closest family. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're, can somebody tell me how good we are for time? We because can do another 10 minutes, yeah, yeah, said good. Neil. Yeah, yeah, great, excellent. Yeah. Are you happy taking more? Yeah, 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 yeah fantastic. Um, trying to spread these around, but yeah, it was a lady wiving around. At the back, waving, yeah. very back. Yes. In this amazing, this is only the third yeah. event in this venue, you know, yeah. apparently. It's a great venue. Oh, didn't see this coming. Neil, you've written the most beautiful love songs that have punctuated my life. Love is a bourgeois construct, memory of the future. Uh, it always comes as a surprise. Thank you. Thank my you. question, you're from Newcastle. That's a good song for your wedding. No, I, I got married to no, here. Sorry, I'm I got married to here. No, sorry, I'm saying it always comes as a surprise, a good song for a wedding. Yeah. <laughs> but the, to the lady in the front, I got married to here. Yes. And I had oh, to here. My, oh, very good, yes. Yeah. And okay. I, got, I had both my children to uh, Pet Shop Boy songs. Oh, God. <laughs> anyway. In I, my experience, babies like a four on the floor beat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm kind of a fan. But here's my question. So, my darling, you're from Newcastle. Your colleagues from Blackpool. Yes. I'm from Doncaster. So oh. my question is. I've never been to Doncaster. Yeah. Neil, keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been through it on the train a gazillion times. Um. How has northernness affected your writing? Well, that's a popular question. Um, well, of course, both Chris and I are northern, northeast and northwest. And northeast and northwest is very, very different. Yeah. Um, Northwesterners, you know, is where a lot of humour comes from. A lot of famous comedians come from the northwest. Northeasterners are much more earnest, I think. Uh, mm. Sting springs to mind, and uh, <laughs> um, and um, and I'm a bit like that too, really. And also, northeasterners are are a bit more pretentious, I think. <laughs> Again. The person I just mentioned, Brian Ferry, you know, mm -hmm. in a good way, I mean, you know. Um, and, but also there is still, I think Chris and I still have something of the attitude of an outsider in London. We love London because we're like fans of it and we've lived here for an awfully long time. Um, but we're not from here. And so it gives you a, a sort of critical eye or a journalistic eye looking at something that you live in and amongst but don't come from uh, and I, at the same time I could say I regard myself as a Londoner in many ways but, but I'm always aware the way people talk and attitudes and I, and I had a house in Durham which I just sold last year for 20 years um, so I, I was still for quite a long time a, a part time northerner by, by where I lived um, and I think it's just a difference of belonging. And I think not belonging is very creatively inspiring because you don't take any, you don't take some place for granted. You're always looking at it with a slightly alien eye. And I think creatively, that's that's quite powerful. Is there a question over from that side? Yes, at the very back, there's a gentleman waving his hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd carry on waving. Hi, what's your favorite lyric you've written for somebody else? I think So Sorry I Said for Liza Minnelli. Um, <laughs> is that in the book? I think it is, yes, it is in the book. Um, that was when I was going through to what musical theatre before. There was, in the late 80s, early 90s, there was the Stephen Sondheim phase. Um, 
where actually I had a Stephen Sondheim book of songs on my piano, and um, I was learning all his chord changes, and um, and I sort of thought of that as being like a Stephen Sondheim relationship song. I mean, it could have come out of some sort of show, really. And to have Liza Minnelli sing it and act it. Um, mm. Last weekend, just on Friday, we were in the Hackney Empire, not far from here, seeing Johnny Woo's on Royal Variety Show. Uh, and and I, someone said, when was the last time you were in here? I said, I think it was when Liza Minnelli recorded the video for So Sorry I Said in 1990 with Terence Donovan filming it. And, and she sat in the middle of the stalls, and he, and he filmed her about 15 times. And every time on the last line, she cried out of one eye. It was just, <laughs> it was really, really, I'm sorry, this isn't about lyrics, but it was really, I just could suddenly ha kept having this memory of lies. And the last line, so sorry. I said, tear comes down out of this eye. <laughs> and I said, how do you do that? And she said, oh, I just think of something really sad. I thought it was just, and I think that I, I've always liked that uh, thought. What we tried to do with Liza Minnelli really worked in that song, and, uh, and I always felt quite proud of it. Right. Sorry, another one down at the front. The lady, the, um, yes. You she needs a microphone. Yes, yeah. sorry, making a phone call. Oh, yes. <laughs> Mom, I'm asking a question. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm Rachel from Barcelona, Spain. Hello. Hello. <clears throat> uh, and I know currently you are interested in Brexit uh, situation. You know what? <laughs> no, just to... Don't ask me a question. We're all over it. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> We're all over it. Yeah. Just to ask you if you... Have to, have, ah, sorry. <laughs> have you thought about writing some lyrics about it? Oh. <laughs> Ironically or so? Oh, good question. Um, well, yeah, sort of. Yeah, there's, there's, well, I think I've mentioned in an interview that Chris and I have just been writing a song called, it's been gestating for a while, actually, and it's definitely from the ironic um, uh, stable of Pet Shop Boys songs. It's called Give Stupidity a Chance. <laughs> Um, that's not specifically about Brexit. I mean, there's, you can just fill in the gaps yourself, let's face it. Uh, I think it's really interesting that stupidity is like a political movement now. Um, and the point of the song being intelligent people have had their say, it's time for the foolish to get their way. And, um, and, uh, <laughs> but, but Chris has written a really catchy melody. Um, there's something really, it's funny, but like so many of our songs, there's something just slightly, there's a sort of sadness about it as well at the same time. Maybe we'll, this song will never hear the light of day, but maybe it will. Yeah. And there's a chap there with a T-shirt. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that I love about Pet Shop Boys when they release new material is working out what the new album title is going to be. I'm not going to ask you that because you're not going to tell me. We haven't thought of it. Okay, fair enough. I, I've, always, I've always wanted to know, why did you call behaviour, behaviour? Hmm. Um. <laughs> I don't know, but I think it was a good choice. <laughs> um. I think I thought of it. Um, it just seemed to work. We also like the fact that in America they spell it without a U, so the American version doesn't have a U in it. Um, but um, no, it just seemed to, the album's sort of serious and it sort of is about people's behavior. Um, and it's great when you can just get one, I mean, we know we're stuck in this thing, we have to think of one word. Um, and I know there are a lot of words, but um, it's, diff it's, it's really, sometimes it just arrives like very did. Um, bilingual, we had bilingual before we even started the album. And uh, actually we had, before we started the album. And um, it's, it's, sometimes when they land, they're just perfect. And I think behavior, for some reason it sounds slightly autumnal, the word behavior. There's no logical reason for that to be the case. Um, but it, it just seemed to fit. 
more? Two more. Two more. Okay, two more. Um, hang on, I'm trying to spread these around a bit. <laughs> Was there somebody waving very yes. hard up at the back? Yeah. In the, there. Sorry, that doesn't help really, does it? Um, yes, the lady up there waving. Yes, thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, talking about the the uh, how important uh, pop music is and how it has been growing up, and you know, sort of the Beatles and uh, Bowie and all the music through the eighties and nineties. Basically, is it still as good as it used to be, or am I just kind of getting old? <laughs> it it, it feels it feels like it's not as much of an important piece of our culture as it used to be. It's difficult to answer that unless you're of the age where pop music can be the most important thing in your life. Because, you know, when I was from about the age of eight or nine, you know, it was the most important thing to me. Now, to some people, that would have been football or, or cricket or, or just watching the telly, um, you know. And so it... I mean, I have a, I have a nephew um, who is obsessed by music. Um, they were once round at my house, him and his parents, and I said, where's Joseph? And as we were all sitting talking after Sunday lunch, Joseph had got in the car and was sitting. I said, why is he in the car? And his father, my brother Philip, said, he's listening to the chart show. And I thought, that was really great. He was going to sit there and listen to the top 40 from 40 to 1. And he would do that every week. I, he may still do I don't, He may have got a bit cooler now because he's about 17 now. Uh, but to him, I, I, I think he would say to you that, um, no, it's still as important. But maybe there's less people like him. And maybe there are more kinds of technology to compete with that, games and all the rest of it. Okay, so you've got a terrible Someone thing. Someone waving over here, look. Uh, okay, yes. Come on, let's have right. a waving man. Wavy man, you. Yeah. Yes, last one, because I noticed people are starting to slip out the back. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're doing a concert, you always notice when you're doing a song, people go and get a drink. <laughs> Chris, Chris always says... No one likes King's Cross, where everyone goes and has a drink. <laughs> and I say, well, it's my favourite song in the show, and it's staying in. Chris has spent the entire Super Tour <laughs> trying to get rid of Home and Dry. <laughs> anyway, Waving Man. Um, hi. Hi. Um, Hi. So before my question, I just Hola. want to say that um, your music, the Pet Shop Boys music, is a big reason that I like exist because uh, my mom, when she was a teenager, uh, picked up Suburbia on the tape and it basically kick-started her learning English because she's from Spain oh. and basically brought it to this country and it's a big influence on my life. So I just want to say thank you to the Pet Shop Boys for doing that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the good thing about literate pop, you see, you can learn English to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so my question is, uh, because I'm 20 and probably like one of the long youngest listeners to Pet Shop Boys, um, I just want to ask, uh, <laughs> that wasn't in, like, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, um, when you write music, at least now, maybe not so in the past, but now, do you... Do you focus on sort of the generation that you've always been writing for? Do you kind of Im take influence from other generations, like a newer generation, so for example, my generation of music and that kind of style? Because I know that you're into pop music of, like today. Is that something that's influenced? Um, well, in terms of writing lyrics, I, I you know, one of uh, something we haven't actually referred to in the in, in interview really is I try to pretend I'm someone else. There's quite a bit about this in the book. Um, like on the last album, we had a song called 20 Something. And I'm not pretending I'm a 20 something, but I'm looking at a 20 something in London and, and seeing what their life is like and imagine what it, imagining what it's like being that person. Um, 
and that's something I, you know, I do, I do quite a lot. So I don't, I've never just written from my age, my gender, and my point of view. And on that bombshell, seeing that someone's phone's gone off. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I'm afraid we actually have to end now. Um, we should also point out you signed lots more books this we afternoon. We signed books I all afternoon. They, and, and I think you've bought them all, so thank you very much yeah, for that. And <laughs> and also and, thank you all very much for coming. I really, it's really wonderful of you. I really appreciate it. And also your questions were very good. And thanks to Michael for his questions. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Love you. Bye-bye. <laughs>